All right, so today we're diving deep, and I mean deep, into the life of someone most people probably think they know, St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest, he's often relegated to, you know, that name in a history book, a stained glass window. Yeah, it's easy to picture him surrounded by incense and, uh, well, you know, that whole saintly vibe. But trust me, Augustine's world was a lot more, shall we say, Game of Thrones. Oh, absolutely. Think North Africa, 4th century AD. We're not talking dusty ruins here, but bustling Roman cities, a world on the edge of massive change, and Augustine. Right in the thick of it, soaking it all in. And we've got some great excerpts from Britannica to unpack all of this. I'm telling you, his life, anything but ordinary. But to really understand his impact, we got to start with his roots. So tell us, where does this future saint story even begin? Well, he's born in 354 AD in Tagaste, which is modern-day Algeria. His family, not wealthy, but they really grasped the importance of education, even scraping by at times to give him the best schooling possible. And that investment, wow, did it ever pay off. Augustine was, what, a bit of a child prodigy. He was definitely a gifted student, that's for sure. And eventually he finds himself in Carthage. Think of it like, I don't know, the New York City of Roman Africa, a real hub of, you know, intellectual and cultural life. Oh, I see the comparison. So. This is where he really starts to make a name for himself. Exactly. This is where Augustine hones his skills in rhetoric. And remember, in this era, we're talking ancient world, rhetoric, public speaking, debate. That's not just a skill, it's essential, especially in Roman society. And Augustine, well, he mastered it. Okay, so we've got this small town boy turned star debater. But something tells me Augustine wasn't content with just being good at it. This guy was ambitious. Oh, he was driven, that's for sure. He wanted more than just a quiet life back in Tagaste. Recognition, success, maybe even a touch of fame. This ambition, it's what leads him first to Carthage and then, well, to Rome itself. Wow, from Carthage to the heart of the Roman Empire, that's a big leap. So what's Rome like for him? You know, it wasn't all smooth sailing. Rome, even for someone as talented as Augustine, it could be a tough city. He struggles, at least at first, you know, faces some setbacks. So even future saints have their early career struggles. It's kind of comforting, actually. Mm -hmm. But what changes for him? How does he finally find his footing? Well, his luck turns around when he lands a, shall we say, prestigious teaching position in Milan. Okay, now that's a big deal, right? This isn't just any city. No. Milan was a center of power, influence, you name it. And his role, it puts him in direct contact with, well, basically the intellectual elite of the Western Roman Empire. Talk about the big leagues. So here he is at the top of his game, at least it seems like it. This is where we'd expect, I don't know, a victory lap, right? But we know there's this massive shift coming. He eventually leaves Milan, heads back to Africa, starts down a completely different path. What happened? So prestigious teaching position, connections to the who's who of Milan. I mean, that sounds like Augustine had it made. What prompts this huge life change? Was it some kind of, you know, epiphany, a, a crisis of conscience? Well, it wasn't like a sudden lightning strike, you know, more like a gradual process of I'd say introspection. He was always a seeker, even in his younger years. Explored different philosophies, dabbled in various belief systems, always searching for something more. I can relate to that. It was this restlessness, this uh, deep questioning that eventually brought him back to Christianity, the faith of his childhood. So more of a homecoming than a conversion then? In a way, I suppose you could say that. But it wasn't just a simple return to the familiar. Augustine, he dove headfirst into Christian theology, wrestling with its core ideas. And it's during this period, this intense period of reflection, that he makes a decision that'll change everything. He resigns from his position in Milan, goes back to Africa, and ultimately, well, he's ordained a priest in Hippo. Hippo, the city he'd eventually lead during a time of crisis, right? That's right. It's like his life was preparing him for that very moment. But before we get to the fall of Hippo, let's talk about his work as bishop. Because he wasn't just, you know, leading prayers and giving sermons, was he? Oh, not at all. Augustine found himself right in the middle of some pretty heated theological debates. One of the biggest was with a group called the Donatists. They believed the church should be a community of, well, the pure, those who'd never wavered in their faith. And they were especially harsh towards those who had, let's say, caved under pressure during times of persecution. A bit of an uncompromising stance, wouldn't you say? You could say that. So how did Augustine respond to that? Well, he argued passionately against this exclusionary view of the church. To him, it wasn't a club for saints, but more like a hospital for sinners, a place for healing and growth. He emphasized God's grace and the potential for redemption, even for those who had strayed. 
That's a pretty radical idea for that time, emphasizing forgiveness and second chances. I imagine his skills and rhetoric came in handy during these debates. Oh, absolutely. Augustine was a force to be reckoned with in any theological dispute. His mastery of language and logic, it was unmatched. But his influence went way beyond just verbal sparring. This was a man who wrote extensively theology, philosophy, even what we might call today, you know, autobiography. Speaking of which, we can't forget his confessions. I mean, that book, it's still so relevant, even for a modern audience. It's just so raw, so honest. Not exactly the picture-perfect image of a saint we often get. You're right. Confessions is remarkable for its candidness. He doesn't shy away from his past, his mistakes, his desires. It's all there. His youthful indiscretions, struggles with faith, his journey from, you know, worldly ambition to this deep spiritual awakening. Really shows you the power of self-reflection, right? Of yeah. Really searching for truth. But of course, he didn't just write about personal experiences. Augustine tackled some of the biggest questions of his time. Questions about good versus evil, free will, and of course, grace which was so central to his whole theological framework. And that brings us to another major theological battle, Augustine versus Pelagius. Ah, yes, Pelagius. Now his views, they caused quite the stir back in the day. That they did. See, Pelagius downplayed the role of divine grace, suggesting that humans, that we have this inherent ability to choose good, to achieve salvation through our own efforts. So basically he emphasized free will over divine intervention. Exactly, and Augustine, Let's just say he was having none of it. He argued that human nature, because of sin, was inherently incapable of achieving true goodness on its own without God's grace. And this wasn't just some intellectual exercise for Augustine. This was about the very core of his faith. So this debate with Pelagius, it wasn't just a difference of opinion. It had huge implications for how people understood their relationship with God, their capacity for good, their path to salvation. Absolutely. And you know what? Even though it seems like ancient history, Augustine's ideas about grace Race, they've continued to shape Christian thought for centuries. It really makes you think, doesn't it? How these theological debates from so long ago, they still resonate with us. But Augustine's world was about to be turned upside down in a way that went far beyond any theological debate. Because while he was grappling with these profound questions of faith, grace, and, well, human nature, the Roman Empire, the world as he knew it, was crumbling around him. So we've got Augustine wrestling with these huge questions of faith and grace and human nature while the world he knows is falling apart. Talk about a turbulent time to be alive. It was a time of, oh, incredible upheaval, uncertainty, you name it. You have to imagine this is Rome, an empire that had stood for centuries, and it was crumbling under its own weight, facing all this pressure from, well, I guess history calls them barbarians. <laughs> right. And let's be honest, those barbarians, they were often just people trying to survive to create a space for themselves in a world that seemed like it was on the verge of collapse. Exactly. But for Augustine, witnessing the fall of Rome, that had to feel apocalyptic. In his writings, especially in The City of God, he really grapples with the meaning of this historical earthquake. The sack of Rome in 410 AD by the Visigoths, he saw it not as the end, but as this powerful reminder of how temporary earthly empires really are. So he used this event to make a theological point about the eternal nature of the city of God. Exactly. He argued that true security, true peace, it only comes from aligning yourself with the city of God, a spiritual reality that transcends the ups and downs of all earthly powers. And this wasn't about, you know, escaping the world, but about living differently in it, a life rooted in faith and focused on a higher purpose. It's amazing how he took such a chaotic historical event the fall of Rome and used it to offer his followers comfort and hope. He was a gifted writer and thinker. But the fall of Rome wasn't just some abstract event for Augustine, right? Because his own city, Hippo, it also ends up under siege. Tragically, you're right. In 430 AD, the Vandals, they turn their attention toward Hippo. And Augustine, he finds himself not just a spiritual leader offering words of comfort, but a shepherd, you know, protecting his flock from real danger. And he doesn't even live to see the outcome of the siege, does he? Sadly, no, he doesn't. Augustine died on August 28, 430 AD. He was 75 years old, and the sounds of battle, they were raging just outside the city walls. What a poignant end to such a dramatic life. A life that spanned, what an incredibly turbulent period in history. It really is remarkable when you think about it. He goes from this restless young man, searching for meaning in a world where empires are crumbling, to becoming this towering figure of faith, someone who wrestled with some of the most fundamental questions that humans have, questions that we still ask today. It is kind of amazing, isn't it? 
that a North African bishop from over 1500 years ago could still be so relevant. He really is. So what can we, I mean, here we are dealing with our own modern anxieties and uncertainties. What can we take away from the life and legacy of St. Augustine? I think one of the biggest takeaways is that the questions he struggled with about faith, about purpose, good and evil, that constant tension between, you know, our desires and our better angels, those are timeless questions. They really are. And his writings, especially confessions, they give us this incredibly honest, raw look into the heart and mind of someone who wrestled with those questions. Yeah, and he doesn't pretend to have all the answers, does he? Not at all. And that's what makes him so relatable, even today. That's a really good point. Augustine's faith wasn't this neat and tidy thing. It was messy and real, full of doubt and questioning. So maybe that's the most important takeaway from our deep dive into Augustine's life. It's okay to wrestle with doubt, to ask tough questions, to keep searching. Sometimes it's in those moments of you know, really looking inward, of trying to make sense of faith and the messiness of life. That's where we often discover our most profound truths. Absolutely. Augustine shows us that faith is a journey, not a destination. And sometimes it's the detours and the struggles along the way that teach us the most. That's a great place to leave it. Thanks for joining me on this deep dive into the life and legacy of St. Augustine. My pleasure. It was a fascinating Focus or grace. The stoic wisdom all up in his face. Kept his cool through the Roman storm. With a calm that was fire, man was born to reform. He said, Mind your kingdom, so take the throne. In a peace, that's what seeds are song. Uh huh. When life's heavy, don't be rattled. Keep your crew steady, never be battled. Oh in time Yeah, mock us, mock us Philosophize In the funk of life He's wise in disguise In the heart of Rome He kept his foe Through wars and trials He'd never fold No way With thoughts like gold And so, so deep A funky emperor In wisdom he steep Life's a dance she up Say step by step, don't give it away. Uh -huh. When chaos comes, take it in stride. Morals gliding on that funky ride. From the palace to the streets, his wisdom spread. Stoic vibes in every word he said. Ooh, yeah. Keep your inner peace, don't let it stray. Marcus Cruel, the ancient Roman way. It's going to be the overriding factor that makes a difference. You know, people need to have purpose to get up. They need purpose to perform. You need to get to a point in your life where there's nothing on the docket. There is no 5K. There's no, I'm going to get into school to be this or that. And still perform to the highest level. But what's funny about it all is that we need these things to perform. But we don't take a second to realize the purpose is always there. The purpose never leaves us because the very purpose is you. You are always the purpose. There may be another purpose, like being a SEAL or going to college or whatever, but the main purpose in life is you. So if you wake up in the morning and you don't want to do something, you don't care enough about yourself. And that's what you need to really research is, man, why am I not doing this for myself? Because that is... That is the number one purpose in life, is to better oneself. So that's the only purpose I can need. Use pain as a fuel. Imagine if you could use the pain as a passport. Imagine if you could use the pain to push you, to condition you, to prepare you for the stages and the rooms you've got to walk into and the tables you've got to sit at and the stages you have to stand on. What if the pain could make you better? What if the pain could build muscle? What if the pain could cause you to reach higher, to leap farther, to run faster? What if the pain could help you? What if all pain isn't hurt, but it's help? We're built to walk uphill. And when you reach the pinnacle of the hill, you want to stop and appreciate the vision, but 
the next thing you want is a higher hill in the distance because it's from the uphill climb that we derive our value. And I mean this technically. So honesty without kindness is brutality. Kindness without honesty is manipulation. Mastering others is strength. Mastering yourself is true power. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Lao Tzu. Overtrusting, betrayal, masturbation, loss of energy, stress, hair loss, overthinking, depression, saying no to important things, revenge, ruining your own life, observing, increase in wisdom, forgiving, healing, letting go, peace of mind. You can keep friends with the people you want to emulate, not the people that you think will be most likely to accept you. The people you associate with will shape your future. Forgive yourself for your faults and your mistakes and move on. Les Brown What philosophy promises. When a man was consulting him how he should persuade his brother to cease being angry with him, Epictetus replied, Philosophy does not propose to secure for a man any external thing. If it did, philosophy would be allowing something which is not within its province. For as the carpenter's material is wood, and that of the statuary is copper, so the matter of the art of living is each man's life. What then is my brother's? That again belongs to his own art, but with respect to yours it is one of the external things, like a piece of land, like health, like reputation. But philosophy promises none of these. In every circumstance I will maintain, she says, the governing part conformable to nature. Whose governing part? His in whom I am, she says. How then shall my brother cease to be angry with me? Bring him to me and I will tell him. But I have nothing to say to you about his anger. When the man who was consulting him said, I seek to know this how, even if my brother is not reconciled to me, shall I maintain myself in a state conformable to nature? Nothing great, said Epictetus, is produced suddenly, since not even the grape or the fig is. If you say to me now that you want a fig, I will answer to you that it requires time. Let it flower first, then put forth fruit, and then ripen. Is then the fruit of a fig tree not perfected suddenly and in one hour? And would you possess the fruit of a man's mind in so short a time and so easily? Do not expect it, even if I tell you. Studying what you are studying, you are only becoming what you are becoming because somebody told you to become it. Why are you doing what you are doing? And that why is going to come from a pure place, a pure, authentic, unadulterated place. Resentment and compliant are appropriate neither for oneself nor others. See, resentment is a complex and multi-layered emotion that has been described as a mixture of disappointment, disgust, anger, fear, bitterness. When life hurts you, when people betray you, your greatest response, love, forgiveness, you must never be bitter. Your responsibility is to get better. See, every trial loves a good triumph. And so you've got to work your bounce back muscle. You have no regrets because you make the right decisions. You are a calculated conversationalist and compliant is to agree excessively to be a yes man or a yes woman. See, life isn't just about learning 
but it's about unlearning. To be compliant would be to be programmed, to be hypnotized by the affairs of this life, to be suggestible that anytime anyone says anything, you believe it and you receive it. And the question must be, what is your reality? Both in fighting and in everyday life, you should be determined, though calm. Need the situation without tenseness. What we do now echoes in eternity. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. It is better to travel well than to arrive, Buddha. Anything you dream is fiction, and anything you accomplish is science. The whole history of mankind is nothing but science fiction. All failures are temporary when you keep trying. The law of assumption states that assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled is the way to realize it. Neville Goddard A blessed and indestructible being has no trouble himself and brings no trouble upon any other being. So he is free from anger and partiality, for all such things imply weakness. and you have the courage enough to speak it, it will happen. You cannot change your life unless you change something. If you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. Your biggest enemy is you. My whole book is about you battling yourself. People don't understand it's you against you. The only person that gets in your way is you. Nobody else. It's you. Everybody thinks they're a loser. Every young person thinks they're a loser. At least a young person in the situation I was at. I, I didn't know I wasn't a loser until I started winning. Until I started doing martial arts. Martial arts taught me that like, I could get better at stuff. That it wasn't, I wasn't really a loser. You will fail at some point in your life. Accept it. You will lose. You will embarrass yourself. You will suck at something. You can't wait for everything to be perfect to start living your life. Because I've, I've that's what I've done. My whole life has been like that. Inside of me it has been, as soon as it's all lined up, I'm gonna show you my 